So, um, Dr. Jamie Lawson uh, is a teaching associate at the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology, uh, and primary, primarily researches sex and sexuality with a focus on identity, embodiment, and power. Jamie is an interdisciplinary queer researcher covering the intersections of social, biological, medical anthropology, and with a background in uh, quantitative and qualitative research, as well as the evolutionary psychology of human mating strategy. Jamie is currently running a project on the practice of puppy play and was recently involved in the Art of Relationships project at the OU. Uh, Jamie's lecture will position the rainbow flag uh, alongside other symbols in the history of queer identity and resistance, moving on to discuss the historical origins of the oppression of queer people in the UK and around the world. Topics include the birth of the gay leather scene, the social history and impact of the HIV epidemic, and the long reach of Victorian attitudes towards sex, which I remember from my first year lectures. Um, Given the continuing prevalence of subtle and overt structural oppression of queer people, and probably equally or more significantly, the rich and frequently overlooked development of queer culture and identity, uh, understanding queer symbols, their context, and their relationship to queer social history is vital. This seems particularly significant in a city such as Bristol, with such a rich and diverse queer community, and for individuals at the university constantly developing in their own queer identities, as well as for those who may not have directly experienced life in this way. Uh, a speaker and a role model such as Jamie is perfect for this, uh, centering a social history perspective, and also who in my time as a student has always considered the intersections of queerness and queer oppression with other forms of structural, structural violence and identity, and the experiences of non-white, non-cis, non-male, disabled, working class, and non-Western queer people, and people of all sorts of different identities. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, uh, Dr. Lawson. Thank you, Jake. That was awesome. Um, it was quite an introduction. Uh, thank you for nominating me to give this lecture. It was um, a genuinely touching and actually quite emotional moment to be nominated as uh, Best of Bristol Lecturer for this year. Um, this is my third year, I think, teaching in Bristol. Um, and it's really very nice that you've all come along to hear me rabbit on about all of that stuff that Jake said I was going to talk about. Um, I wrote that shortly after I was nominated for this, like, and they said, we need a title and an abstract for the talk from you. I was like, yes, yes, cool. And I thought, what should I talk about? And I, I went back when I came to put this lecture together, which obviously was weeks ago. I was very well prepared. Um, <laughs> I looked over the list of things that I'd said I was going to include in this, tonight's talk. I said, blimey, I put a lot in that abstract. Um, and uh, as it turns out, there's not quite room for everything, so I really did want to talk um, more about the leather scene than I'm actually going to. I'm going to mark the point in the talk where I wanted to put uh, the, the leather scene in, and I'll see what I can say about it when I get there. But just to, if people have come specifically to hear about leather, I mean, sorry, but there's other stuff, so we'll be fine. <laughs> This is a really weird room also. I'm used to teaching in a sort of traditional lecture format when I'm down at the bottom and everybody is above me um, and you sort of get coughed and sneezed on for the duration of a lecture. So this is an interesting swapping of positions. Although they did ask me when I arrived, they asked me, they said, we presume you're going to be down on the ground. I was like, there's a stage. I'm going to be on that. Um, and they've given me this to try and stop me from moving around, but it's on wheels, so we'll see how we go. So I'm going to talk um, tonight for probably a little over 40 minutes, um, but there's, someone's going to wave if I start overrunning with time, so we'll see how we go. Um, and basically, yeah, if you start to zone out or get bored or anything, please feel free to leave at any point, um, but hopefully I'll sustain your interest. So I'm going to talk today about this. I'm going to talk about... Um, uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the rainbow flag and then some sort of broader socio-history of queerness in general. Um, the background, I guess, against which queer resistance... Uh, takes place. And I'm going to start by talking about this. Um, this uh, version of the rainbow flag um, was officially adopted by Manchester Pride, which, as I'm sure you know, is one of the bigger uh, prides in the UK. It was officially adopted by Manchester Pride as its pride flag in January of this year. Um, you may notice that it's uh, a little bit different from the pride flags that are around the room, which is really exciting to see. I didn't tell them to put those up, but they're just here, so that's nice. Um, in as much as it's got two uh, stripes, a black and a brown stripe, added to the top of it. Um, this flag was actually first flown at Philadelphia Pride over in the United States in 2017. And it was designed to specifically incorporate non-white identities into the LGBTQ plus movement uh, under, against a general 
understanding against a background, um, against an acknowledgement that the uh, LGBTQ plus movement, while it has made great strides in its own right, is in and of itself quite biased towards um, non-white identities. So the inclusion of the black and the brown stripe on the rainbow flag was really an attempt to extend the symbolism of the rainbow flag, which is um, a symbol of unity, of togetherness, of inclusion, of safety, of queerness, of LGBTQ plusness, but everything else that the flag stands for, to extend that symbolism into a specific subsection of the broader queer community who had been excluded. Um, now, that provoked some reaction, as these things often do, um, from inside the queer community as well as outside it, mostly inside because the non-queer world doesn't really take much notice of what queer people do with their flags, but the queer community responded in ways that weren't entirely constructive. Here are some of the um, uh, responses from inside the queer community towards the adding of the black and the brown stripes to the rainbow flag. This um, uh, box on the bottom, I'll read this out because I have a suspicion that people at the back probably can't make that out, um, is from a pink news article about this decision. Um, that came in the wake of Manchester Pride flying the flag. They um, referenced a survey conducted in the United States a year or so prior. 70% of gay people were opposed to the new flag, um, while most white people and members of the baby boomer generation were also against the move. And I don't know about you, but I find that if I find my opinions aligning with the baby boomer generation, then something's up. <laughs> yeah. 70% of gay people were opposed to the new flag, opposed to adding stripes to the rainbow flag that uh, uh, intentionally signaled the inclusion of non-white um, um, LGBTQ plus people. And this up here is a um, Twitter, uh, a tweet. Um, he'd done a Twitter. Um, uh, that's again, it's in uh, the, uh, some article, uh, I think another Pink News article that was about this issue. Um, I've cropped the tag off the top of it, but you can find that if you want to know who this person is. Um, he writes as follows, The flag includes all as it is. Colour of skin was never what any of the colours stood for. Wrong move here. And again, I don't know about you, but like, they've, they've answered their own question in, in the statement, right? Colour of skin was never what any of the colours stood for. That's exactly why they've been added, because they were absent prior. But, okay, so this talk then is against this background. It's against trying to explain, um, trying to respond really to these issues, these sorts of comments, um, responding specifically in, uh, involving, from a position that involves my own identity um, as a queer white man. Um, trying to respond to some of these voices that are coming from inside my community. So for other members of uh, the broader queer community who are in the audience, that's where I'm positioning myself. For other, uh, for people in the audience who identify as straight, um, I don't know, thank you so much for coming, it's nice to see you. Um, this talk is likely to be about a side of history that you might not know so much about. It's going to introduce you to some um, social history behind the queer uh, and LGBTQ plus pride movements. So we're going to start with the rainbow flag, though. So the flag was originally designed by Gilbert Baker, who died in 2017. Um, Gilbert Baker was a uh, gay-identified um, New Yorker um, who had a history of involvement in queer activism. He was many things, Gilbert Baker. He was a performance artist, he was an occasional drag queen um, and a queer activist who took a particularly theatrical slant towards protest and fighting for queer rights. To give you some indication of the sort of man that B Baker was, um, uh, a few years after he designed the flag and first flew the flag, he joined um, an international queer activist and drag collective called the Order of Perpetual Indulgence, becoming a sister of perpetual indulgence, 
Um, over here, we have a picture of the Cardiff and Bristol houses um, of the order. Um, a group of um, extremely fabulous sisters, as I'm sure you will agree. The Order of Perpetual Indulgence um, is uh, dedicated itself to the promulgation of universal joy and the expiation of stigmatic guilt. They are a performance art group as well as a collection of international drag houses who dedicate their activities towards queer activism, towards charitable activities, and generally being pretty fantastic wherever they go. And Gilbert joined this group um, some years, as I say, after designing the flag. We'll come back to that. Um, because it sort of fits very much, gives you some sense of the sort of activism that Baker was involved in. He was understood the role of theatricality, of glamour um, and fabulousness, and transgression in the pulling together of uh, the queer community broadly stated. And while I was researching this talk, I found um, the transcript, not the transcription, a report written by the FBI after they interviewed Baker in 1987, um, uh, after the Order of Perpetual Indulgence had announced its intention to protest the arrival of the Pope in the United States. They were going to engage in peaceful protest, uh, and the FBI um, asked for uh, an interview and Baker arrived. Um, I don't know if you can read this, but it says, uh, so this is the official FBI report written afterwards. Gilbert Baker was interviewed and advised that his occupation is performance artist and that his stage name is Sister Chanel 2001. It should be noted that Mr. Baker was dressed in a black and white nun's habit. However, the entire, uh, however, the attire included a rhinestone cowl as well as long red tights and patent leather high heel shoes. The nun's habit was slit on the skirt at very strategic locations. <laughs> and that's a formal interview with the FBI, right? Um, he was also there um, with another sister who was dressed similarly, as they um, acknowledge. So Baker is um, uh, a transgressive, um, drag-influenced uh, performance artist. And he is responsible for the development of the rainbow flag which he first flew, which was first flown on the 25th of June in 1978 as part of um, the Gay Freedom Day Parade in New York, which would subs subsequently become known as Pride. Um, you might notice also this here is a more recent photo of Baker in front of his flag. This flag also has another stripe on it. Um, the original rainbow flag had a strip, strip of hot pink right at the top, above where the red currently sits. Uh, and that's what its very first iteration looked like. It changed because uh, the hot pink color was too expensive to stitch into um, multiple flags, so they dropped that color. So already we have this idea that viewing the rainbow flag as something that is immutable, that is unavailable to change, is inconsistent with its history. This thing changed from the very first moment uh, it arrives um, literally on the scene. Um, so, yeah, it's flown in, uh, first flown in 1978 at Gay, Gay Freedom Day Parade. And Gay Freedom Day Parade and subsequently Pride had been organized to mark the um, sort of the birth, really, of the politically queer activist movement that had occurred with the Stonewall Riots in 1969. In June 1969, the Stonewall Riots were a moment of collective uprising from the queer community in New York who responded to repeated harassment by the police um, in a moment of spontaneous civil unrest um, uh, and multiple nights of, of rioting. The uh, Stonewall Riots are very strongly associated with these individuals, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, two trans women of color, who were, um, who, who were responsible for um, really whipping up the crowd into what became this moment of collective unified action against the oppression that queer people were facing at this point in history. So non-white people, non-cis people, trans people, um, drag artists, transgressive activists have been involved in queer resistance, from queer activism from the very first moment. 
And Baker wanted something. He recognized the importance of unity, the importance of getting a community together. And that was what Stonewall had really changed for the LGBTQ plus community. They realized, we realized, that by acting collectively, we can force change. We can require a uh, wide, wider heteronormative society to recognize us and force change by making ourselves visible collectively. That was a lesson that Stonewall taught us and a lesson that queer activists who followed in that tradition were really keen to keep rolling. And Baker, recognizing the importance of symbols, wanted to make something that people could rally round. He designed a flag that would become a symbol of unity, of hope. Um, he selected a rainbow as a representation of something natural, something beautiful, that was very important, that uh, queer people could unify behind and that could be used to symbolize hope and forwards movement and the continuation of what had begun at Stonewall. It's not the only symbol, nor was it the first symbol that the queer community had adopted. Other symbols exist. The uh, pink triangle was used to identify uh, men who had been accused of being homosexual and were confined to concentration camps by the Nazis. Um, the symbol was stitched onto their concentration camp uniforms um, and became a marker of that particular um, stigmatized group. Somewhere between five and 15,000 gay men died during the Holocaust. Um, that's to say nothing of uh, the atrocities that were visited upon lesbians and trans people and other forms of queer identities. It's hard to say anything for certainty because there's very little in the way of records surrounding uh, the um, victims of the Holocaust in specifics. And particularly, there's very little in the way of records of what happened to queer people um, during that period in history in Germany. Um, queer people are often referred to in this context as the forgotten victims of the Holocaust um, because unlike um, many other groups, when the concentration camps were finally liberated, many people who had been sent there for being homosexual, uh, were reincarcerated after that release because homosexuality was still a crime in various different parts of Europe. Um, people had to keep their identities secret for a long time, um, post-World War II, post-liberation, uh, because being uh, queer was a deeply stigmatized position um, in many parts of Europe. It became, um, it was extraordinarily difficult time. If you want to learn more about that, I would point you to these two books, The Men with the Pink Triangle, or IPS, Seal Deported Homosexual. They are not easy reading, but they're important reading, charting the experiences of two men, um, uh, of two gay men and their experiences during uh, the Holocaust. Um, the Pink Triangle, though, was adopted as a symbol of resistance post-World War II by quite a number of gay and lesbian groups who took it on in its, what we call in, in anthropology a moment of cultural resistance, when a group takes on the symbols or the language or the names that their oppressors have used to mark them out as different, as undesirable, and turn it into a symbol of defiance, make it something that is their own. Uh, and the Pink Triangle was adopted in that sort of way by um, various different gay and lesbian activist groups that existed around the same sort of time as Stonewall. This footnote, parenthesis, this incidentally is where, if I had more time and um, I felt like rabbiting on even longer, this is where I would have slotted in a nod to the gay leather scene. Because the gay leather scene is also associated with the end of World War II and was really born out of some social changes that took place in America after the Second World War um, and is associated with the um, de-mobbing of um, uh, soldiers after um, ceasefire. Yeah, and the, that the moment in history um, also created the, the gay leather scene, 
to ways that I can happily talk about over a pint later if you want to know more. But it just struck me as interesting, and this is what I would have said if I had more time, that at the same time as in Europe you have men released from concentration camps who go into hiding or back into prison in some way, where queerness becomes re-oppressed, uh, at the same time as in America a certain type of queerness is really strongly expressing itself. And that was just the beginning of an idea I had that I'd love to work up into something more to say, but anyway, that's, that's where I got with that. Today, though, the, the pink triangle is most commonly associated with um, uh, ACT UP, um, an activist group that um, were formed uh, around 1987, um, most strongly associated with the name of queer activist Larry Kramer, uh, an American-based activist group that became an international activist group. Um, associated, well, which was specifically protesting governmental responses to the HIV crisis. Um, ACT UP engaged in various acts of peaceful political, sorry, peaceful civil disobedience, um, uh, marches, uh, large scale disruption, um, various, again, strongly theatrical protests, marching through streets with coffins carrying the urns of ashes of um, people who died from AIDS at this time, demanding very vocally that the queer community come together uh, and also demanding that the governments of the countries involved took action against what was becoming a um, really serious health crisis, a, a catastrophe. Um, so ACT UP, like in the same sort of tradition of organized collective anger that had begun with the Stonewall movement became a um, very strongly politicized group and adopted the pink triangle as its main symbol, although you may note that it is inverted. Act Up very intentionally flipped the direction of the Nazis' triangle from pointing downwards to pointing upwards um, as some sort of comment on their ownership of that symbol. Right? We've adopted this symbol. It's not the same. We're moving forwards with this. Um, uh, a moment of empowerment for the queer community in that way. But at this point, let's um, move away from the idea of radical protest for the time being and talk instead about the HIV crisis itself. The first reported cases of... Um, HIV in um, the United States were, took, occurred in 1981. The word HIV wasn't used. Um, people didn't know what was going on, but it was the, in that year. Um, two different papers come out from the academic medical community reporting unusual clustering of um, uh, unusual diseases in primarily gay uh, patients. So this extract at the top of this slide is an extract from the abstract of one of those papers. Four previously healthy homosexual men contracted pneumocystis carinii pneumonia um, and various other conditions. Suddenly a clustering of unusual uh, illnesses that cluster within an individual. So people have a collection of different illnesses and also a lot of people get the same clustering of illnesses and doctors start to notice that something is up. Not least because the illnesses that are starting to appear suddenly are things that the body is, under normal situations, quite able to defend itself from. There were very strong suggestions quite early on that something was up with the immune system of the people who were um, uh, becoming sick. Um, it didn't take long from that, that first clustering of cases in the early 1980s for things to get um, very serious indeed. People started dying of a disease that nobody understood. Uh, the gay community um, was terrified. Um, and nobody was really stepping in to help. Nobody did anything. There was no official response from the American government. Um, right up until 1987. Um, at the end of 1988, there had been 82,362 cases of AIDS reported in the United States, and 60,000 people had died. 
um, of that disease. And so that's like just one year before those statistics was the first time that the American government actually formally acknowledged that anything was going on. And the reason for that gap in between like, the outbreak of what was very obviously a very serious epidemic of something that didn't have a name, that nobody understood, but something um, was happening, the reason for the gap between that moment and some official response from what was the uh, Reagan administration at the time seems to be due to the fact that those first clusterings of cases, the United States' first like, epidemiological encounter with this disease associates it with gay men right off the bat. There is a cultural association that comes out of that moment, that clustering of cases, that just makes this a, a queer disease really, really quickly. And the American government, the Amer American culture at the time, didn't seem to care much what was happening to its queer population. As a nice example of that, you can, I invite you to reflect on the original naming of what became HIV. Um, it wasn't named HIV until 1986. In 1982, it was named GRID, Gay Related Immune Deficiency, which was a name for a disease. That was a thing that people could be diagnosed with. And I just want you to take a moment to think about the fact that that has the word gay in its name. That if you arrive at the doctors with a specific collection of symptoms, regardless what you tell them about your identity, you're diagnosed not just with a horrendous and life-threatening disease at the time, but also an identity. You're diagnosed as gay alongside everything else. Um, about that same sort of time in 1982, you get the face, first cases reported in Europe. Um, the first drug treatments are developed in 1987, um, which is around the same time that, uh, as I said, that's the first time that Reagan begins talking about AIDS publicly. The first time he says the name of the syndrome publicly is in 1987, and he says this sort of thing about it. This is Reagan talking to um, a group of medical professionals about sex education in schools. And he says, um, like a fairly standard um, Republican message, that um, parents and schools have to decide how sex education is taught. Uh, but let's be honest with ourselves, he says, AIDS information cannot be what some call value neutral. After all, when it comes to preventing AIDS, don't medicine and morality teach the same lesson? A really pernicious, insidious joining together of health with morality um, that sloshes around through Western culture, that marked out uh, people who behave in sexually transgressive ways, people who are queer as being immoral, and therefore deserving of the illness that they are experiencing. Now, the original uh, initial outbreak of what is now a global epidemic of HIV um, predates by some way the uh, first reported cases um, in the US in 1981. The um, original, what we know now, what, um, and this knowledge has been pieced together um, from our current point in history, looking back, doing with some really exciting genetic work that's been done on HIV, the HIV virus itself and some piecing together of socio-history, um, the initial outbreak of what became uh, the global epidemic, the pandemic strain of HIV, seems to have occurred somewhere around the 1920s. And it, um, it most likely occurred in uh, Kinshasa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, what was at the time Leopoldville in the Belgian Congo. Um, Belgium controlled that territory as a colonial power from 1908 to 1960. And um, I'm not going to talk about this very in great detail, um, given the, the time constraints here, but there's a, a lot of evidence, as this quote down here suggests, that really connects, very strongly connects, the original, the first outbreak of what becomes a global pandemic of HIV, this particular moment, uh, with colonialist practice in this part of the world. There's a little um, uh, sort of three-step model of what likely took place um, in order for the... which you guys probably can't see. Yeah? You okay? Um, um, 
a little three-stage model that, um, of three sort of events that seem to have probably took place uh, before the original outbreak of this pandemic uh, strain of HIV. Um, humans uh, butcher chimpanzees infected with a, um, uh, their own version of the HIV, that the HIV jumped from chimpanzees into humans as a consequence probably of humans butchering chimpanzees for food. Um, that uh, in humans get infected with this new um, disease that's jumped species, that they travel along a river towards Kinshasa, where uh, this outbreak begins. And every step of that journey, every moment in that story that we've pieced together, is the consequence of colonial practice in this part of the world. That the reason people are inexpertly hunting and butchering chimpanzees at this time is because they have fled from their villages as um, colonially, colonial administrative powers have entered their um, territories and are compelling people to tap rubber through all sorts of horrendous practices like kidnapping families, torturing people, enslaving people, putting them to work. People are scared, um, people are um, right at the limits of what they're able to cope with. And one other thing that we know about HIV now, looking at it as a global pandemic, is it associates very strongly with people who are under strain, people who are marginalized, people who are stressed, um, who are living through political change, uh, through the outbreak of war, or who experience marginalization through any number of means. And it seems as if like, those, all of those things are occurring in various different parts of Africa and other parts of the world, in this part of Africa particularly, as a consequence of colonialist activity, as a consequence of the brutality of the regimes that have been put in place in these parts of Africa. So individuals who are running for their lives, who have, um, unbeknownst, unbeknownst to themselves, become infected with a disease that's jumped species, reach a large um, city, uh, Leopoldville, is now Kinshasa, a seething metropolis, the administrative capital of the, uh, of the Belgian Congo, where they encounter other uh, colonialist practices, where there's like it's a, 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 um, a really, like disease transmission becomes a really pressing problem at this, uh, in these sorts of areas. To give you an example of the sorts of things that are going on around this time, this image down here is a picture of a hypodermic syringe that would have been available to doctors at this point in history in the early 1900s. Hypodermics were expensive, they were handmade, made for hand-blown glass and hand-worked uh, needles, and people didn't have many of them. Um, at one point, French doctors used six of these to vaccinate 80,000 African workers against sleeping sickness with the aim of keeping them able to work. So if you have any sort of blood-borne transmission in that situation, you can see how that's going to go epidemic quite rapidly. People um, interacting with each other in all sorts of ways and other colonial practices stepping in to increase the risks of transmission. So HIV then becomes, from a socio-historical angle, really closely associated with uh, the colonialist project. If you want to know more about what the colonialist project produced, or if we become interested in the effects of colonialism, then really we can do no better than to turn our attention to Victorian Britain. Uh, the Victorians were a uh, colonialist, em colonialist empire at its absolute peak. This is Britain at peak global power, at peak wealth, Britain, along with many of the other colonialist European powers, were extraordinarily wealthy and had made that wealth um, through a process of invasion, subjugation, exploitation and enslavement of other cultures. Gone out around the world and um, taken what they wanted from other uh, countries, from other territories, other cultures. Um, and really... I mean, this, this, um, this map here 
says a lot like, about what the empire was like. So in the middle here, we've got some countries. It gives you some indication of the reach of the British Empire at this point. There's uh, some bits and bobs missing, but I want instead to draw your attention to what's going on around the edges of this map. This is a Victorian map demonstrating the wealth and the scope of the British Empire. Um, and you've got all sorts of things going on, right? We've got, in the middle here, we have uh, Britannia herself, um, a white woman literally sitting on the world, right, in a position of great authority and power, around whom non-white people are literally subjugating themselves, like people kneeling around Britannia, and all the way around the borders of the image, you've got all sorts of people from different parts of the world, various non-white, non-European identities, paying homage to Britannia. But it's this corner of the image that I really want to draw your attention to, because over here we've got the real power um, in this map. Over here, you've got a, a European, a British man. He's got an exciting moustache. He is the only person in the picture with a gun. He's holding a um, big cat on a chain uh, that is sort of cowed beneath his power and he's got an Indian servant, a slave, literally doubled over with the weight of his baggage behind him. And this guy has come out and travelled out across the world and has um, taken what he wants from the rest of uh, the, the people in this image. That it is him who has uh, generated the wealth for the Victorian Empire. Up here we've got some uh, exciting words, freedom, fraternity, federation. The word freedom is particularly ironic. Literally nothing in the world looks less like freedom to me than this map. But the thing about being a colonialist power is that um, the colonialist project needs to be backed up somehow. You need to have a way to explain what you're doing to yourself and to your populace, if that's what you're going to be doing, that doesn't involve you having to confront your identity as a slaver, um, as essentially a pirate, as the exploiter of the less privileged. That's not an identity that would sit easily with uh, individuals or with a populace or with a country. So instead, you get narratives of superiority being created by European cultures. Um, and the image... Uh, and to the, to begin with, they structure ideas of superiority around what seems to be the most obvious difference between the European colonialists and the people that they're exploiting. They create a difference based around skin colour. They create a difference, a set of differences around what becomes known as race. And they create a view of the world where people who are white are innately superior. The idea of white supremacy is at the absolute core of the colonialist project. Because without it, the whole thing just involves acknowledging that you're um, uh, exploiting the world. It becomes a hard thing to shore up without an idea of, of supremacy from somewhere, of superiority coming from somewhere. To begin with, that idea is backed up by religion, God-given ideas of supremacy and superiority, um, that Europe becomes this privileged part of the world where um, civilization first begin by the, begins by the grace of God. And then that idea gets shorn up by um, evolutionary science. Darwin's ideas rock along and give a nice scientific credential to back this sort of idea up. Because an evolutionary mindset allows you to create ideas of superiority and difference. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner of this image here, you've got an image that you've probably all seen at some point uh, presenting a progression of human evolution from doubled over chimpanzee of, of people getting more and more upright as they go. Uh, on the far right of these images, still, most often when you see them, on the very far right of these images, uh, as the example of the most evolved figure, uh, the human in this map, is represented by a white European man. They are considered to be the absolute zenith of cultural progress, of evolutionary progress, and that idea of supremacy used to justify what has been done in the name of producing wealth of the capitalist colonialist project. 
So the Victorians like, create this idea, and it's been uh, running through society since colonialism began, which was some hundred years before the Victorians get there, but these ideas really crystallise into a set of sort of symbols and iconography and cultural ideas during the Victorian era. The Victorians have other ideas as well about various things, um, particularly uh, connected to sex, but these things too are all connected to their ideal of society, um, connected to their ideas of empire building and empire maintenance, and connected to the idea of wealth generation. Victorian ideas around sex centre around their need to produce a workforce, the need to um, keep the uh, working class producing offspring so that um, uh, factories and the new industrial landscape can keep turning over. Um, so the Victorians have this aim of creating and perpetuating a productive capitalist society um, and also have a secondary aim, well, I guess an equally important aim, of building legacy. Victorians are all about the future. They build. They build bridges, they build boats, they build all sorts of things. They build Bristol. They build a, the society that they want Britain to be like. We all are currently living in the society that the Victorians very intentionally built. They build for legacy. And Victorian ideas around sex are informed by Christianity. They come from somewhere older, but they crystallise into a, something that has really serious edges during this period in history. Victorians have this reputation for being somewhat prudish about sex. The reverse is true. They were completely obsessed with sex and the things that people did with their genitals. Um, it's around this time that um, attitudes towards sex workers shift towards um, viewing sex workers as um, a class of people who are a public health problem. The Victorians... Um, uh, turn against essentially any people who have anything to do with the production of sex for pleasure. And sex workers become a target for that. You can see here this idea of um, a female sex worker here being strongly associated with vectoring disease. And that's an idea that the Victorians construct, reconceptualizing whole groups of society here, sex workers, as a public health concern. They also get a bit of a bee in their bonnet about masturbation, um, in as much as they want people to stop doing it, please. Um, they develop all sorts of exciting um, uh, tricks and toys for stopping people uh, masturbating. These two things here at the bottom of the slide are Victorian anti-masturbation devices to be fitted to boys and girls, um, to render access to the genitals impossible, like you get fitted with these things before you go to bed at night, stop you touching yourself. This up here is quite a famous image of a young man who has um, uh, experienced the near fatal consequences of too much masturbation. He is um, unable to get up, completely lethargic. His eyes are sunken, his skin is drawn, he is clutching a sticky hanky in his hand. He has quite literally wanked himself into oblivion. And, yeah, and, that, and we still have ideas about masturbation as something that is shameful, as something that is not, um, um, yeah, that, that's shameful or sinful or unclean in some way. And these ideas come straight from the way in which Victorians conceptualised any sort of sex that was not had for reproduction because they needed people to make more people. I really don't have time to talk about the Kellogg's cornflakes, I'm sorry. Uh, ask me, I'll tell you. So the colonialist project right, takes around the world, exports, like, along with all of the colonialist ships and the, and the uh, slaver vessels and the, um, everything else, the adventurers and the colonialists that went off and um, exploited the rest of the world, they take with them the central idea that justifies the whole thing, which is this idea that whiteness represents civilization itself, that the white Europeans are spreading the glorious news of civilization to the rest of the world um, uh, and uh, exporting that idea of white supremacy um, as they go, as part of that structure. 
They also export, um, European colonialists export, their other ideas about the way in which people are supposed to relate to each other or exist and conceptualize as anything that is not like them, that happens in ways that are different to European culture, things that are non-white, for example, as being uncivilized and therefore um, open to exploitation by civilization, by the European civilized um, white cultures. Other things that are included in the definition of what is uncivilized, among many other things, are things like this, sexual pleasure, masturbation, sex work, female sexuality in general, uh, non-white bodies, trans bodies and trans identities, non-heterosexuality, queerness broadly stated, the list goes on. These things are viewed as being immoral, unclean, sinful, bestial, savage, uncivilized, um, uh, and therefore uh, available for censure and um, punishment by the uh, get meted out against the uncivilized world that um, demonstrates these traits. Now, these ideas have a really, really long reach. This is um, uh, a quote from an ethnography of a North American culture called the Crow. Um, and along, so, along with many other indigenous North American cultures, the Crow have more than two genders. They have a third gender that's known as, has become known as Two-Spirit, Two-Spirit people. And Two-Spirit people um, occupy a space that is somewhere in between the other gender categories that the crow have that are roughly equivalent with man and woman. Um, and it turns out that having more than two genders is not at all uncommon. Uh, uh, if you look at the spread of human cultures, quite a lot of different human cultures have three genders, some have many, many more than that. Having a binary gender system is by no means like the ethnographic norm. There's a lot of variation around that idea. But this is how um, some actual, honest-to-goodness anthropologists wrote about their experience of meeting two-spirit people among the crow in the 1960s. Most civilized communities recognize by two genders, the masculine and feminine, but strange to say, these people have a neuter. Now, that last idea is just ethnographically incorrect. There is nothing that is neutral about the two-spirit identity. It is a gender identity in its own right. It exists as individuals. But I just want to draw your attention to the use of that word, civilized. What Thompson and Ewers are saying is, this is not European. This doesn't seem very white to me. That's what that word signifies. Some sort of cultural difference that has marked this group out as being less than the white, binary, gender-systemed um, uh, culture from which these anthropologists come. This idea uh, of thinking about um, what society finds acceptable in terms of what people do with their bodies has been uh, turned into this diagram by the anthropologist Gail Rubin. Um, Rubin um, uh, yeah, drew this sort of circular diagram, um, placing in the middle this inner circle, the charmed circle, all of the things that culture, that um, European and American society expects sex to be like, wants sex to be like, sex that they approve of um, uh, very easily. Um, and Rubin argues that these ideas come straight out of uh, Victorian attitudes towards sex. Um, so you have the privileges, privileging of heterosexual identity, the privileging of sex that is had within um, a uh, monogamous marriage, uh, marital relationship that doesn't involve sex toys, that doesn't involve pain, all sorts of things. Whereas on the outer limits, so-called, of the diagram, you have sex that is transgressive, that is not approved of, that attracts social disapproval, censure, legislation, public debate, things like using sex toys, viewing porn, having sex outside, um, having, uh, being promiscuous, um, being queer, um, having any form of sex that doesn't involve the production of offspring. And really, the, fo the um, main point of the argument I've been presenting to you this evening is that we should be including within that idea of sex that is um, uh, privileged by society,
um, sex that involves uh, white bodies and uh, non-trans cis bodies as well, that this all becomes part of the same broad cultural message that is sent out to members of um, uh, Western, uh, European and American culture, broadly stated. I'm right up against things in terms of time limits, so I'll, 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 I'll wind down with this. Now, this is what I, I guess I've been trying to get at this evening. Uh, and again, against the idea of that rainbow flag that I started this talk with and the um, objection to the specific inclusion of um, symbols of um, uh, racial diversity within the LGBTQ plus community. <coughs> of course, differences exist. And of course, we have to be mindful of them. And of course, lines of oppression differ. Uh, the lines of oppression that different minority groups differ from one another. The sorts of um, uh, experiences that I have as a gay man are very different from the experiences of my trans and non-binary siblings. Uh, are very different from the experiences that uh, BAME people experience in Britain. Um, and we have to be mindful and respectful of those differences. And that list goes on, obviously. But to no small extent, there is a central similarity between the experience of oppression for being any sort of minority within Western culture, um, essentially boiling down to the fact that all minority groups share the same enemy, the um, archetype of the white colonialist male. Um, uh, and while those specific lines of oppression may differ, that origin in white colonialism is a constant. So I will leave that there, I think. I'll leave you with this um, other new version of the rainbow flag, more recently designed by Daniel Quasar. Uh, this is the progress flag that incorporates into a... Um, I want to avoid saying the word traditional, but I can't think of another word. The more com commonly used uh, traditional rainbow stripe um, specific stripes representing non-white individuals and uh, incorporates the trans flag as well into its structure. Um, I also just wanted to take the uh, opportunity, um, slightly awkwardly, to point out that I have a book coming out um, towards the end of the year, um, a book called Rainbow Revolutions, Power, Pride and Protest in the Fight for Queer Rights, which covers quite a lot of what I've said this evening but is pitched more at uh, young readers around 12 and upwards, although I'm sure you will all enjoy it as well. So there you are. And I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Um, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Jamie, for... Um, uh, that was, like, brilliant. Like, I don't need to tell you guys. Um, <laughs> We've got, um, I think, like 20 minutes of time for some questions and a really fun, soft microphone. Uh, so if anybody has any questions... Uh, I'll throw it at you. Yeah, well, I'll throw it at you. It's a portable so companion cube, if that means anything <laughs> to anybody. No? Oh, sad. Okay. Um, anybody? Do you want... Throw it, throw it. Any questions? Okay, yeah. uh, it's not actually a question. I just really want to know about the cornflakes. Sorry? I want to know about the cornflakes. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, the cornflakes. Can you see that? Never mind. Do this a bit. Um, uh, yeah, um, every time I give this sort of talk, so people who've ever seen me talk about this will always already be familiar with this fact. Um, Victorian attitudes towards masturbation in particular. Um, like, again, conceiving of masturbation as a health problem, also get exported to the United States. And the, what goes on in the US around this time is, all, is, like, sociologically fascinating. It's like the US in the early 20th century is the UK, but on some exciting drug. It's like, they just take it up here, always. I mean, it's already pretty advanced. So, um, cornflakes were developed by, I um, can't remember his names, Dr. Kellogg, um, uh, as they were designed to be a boring, um, unarousing, high-fiber breakfast cereal, specifically designed to stop 
people masturbating because he conceived of masturbation as being at the root cause of everything that was wrong with people um, and in itself the consequence of too, too little fibre in the diet. So he developed a range of breakfast cereals that were fantastically boring and contained nothing but fibre to stop people wanking. Do you want to shout into the cube? <laughs> the cube. Um, I wondered about like Rome and Greece and how, like, what we can learn from the Romans and the Greeks about their approach to queer. Yeah. So yeah, there. I, yes, I did indeed put like the um, the birth of the queer identity, queer identities, and various different oppressed identities come from colonialism. Yeah, that's a fair summary. Um, you hear a lot about uh, Rome and Greece um, when people start talking about queer history, and they're often presented as a sort of exciting queer utopia, often, um, where people are able uh, to have sex with whoever they want, of whatever gender identity they want, without much trouble. Um, that's true to an extent. It was mostly true for men in Rome and Greece, and... <coughs> It's only true for men with regards to their power. So powerful men, essentially, you're allowed to have sex with anybody if you're a Roman citizen, as long as they're less powerful than you. Um, uh, so you have, men are allowed to have sex with women because women are lower in status, and men are allowed to have sex with younger men um, and slaves because they're low in power. But as soon as powerful men start having sex with other powerful men, things get a bit complicated. But yeah, there's some sort of thing that we might recognise as queerness in Rome and Greece, but there isn't a way to actually be gay in Rome. There isn't an identity. There's sort of patterns of sexual behaviour, but there isn't any... Um, any group of people, there's no, there's, no, yeah, there's no identity to grab hold of. Um, whereas in, and it's a thing that the Victorians really change, they create the idea of the homosexual as a type of person, uh, as a class of people who become a public health concern, who can be legislated against. Um, can we learn anything from Greece and Rome? I don't know. Um, uh, it's interesting to see sort of how a, a different thing functions, but I guess we are where we are. But things weren't quite as straightforward in Rome as I think they're often presented as being. But thank, thank you, interesting question. With a question, I think we have time for a couple more, probably. Um, yeah. Go for it. Would you like the, cu the cube? Speaking to the cube. Hi. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on kind of the use of social media in modern uh, kind of queer resistance movements and queer activist movements, whether you think it can be used productively to bring communities together on a global scale, or if it kind of encourages uh, kind of hate online and things like that or whether we can use it or whether it should just be kind of avoided? So, it's a really interesting question, and uh, like there's a, a lot of complex answers to that. Um, I'm an anthropologist, right, and one thing that anthropologists do is refuse to come down squarely on any given topic at all. So if you're asking me, is social media a good thing or a bad thing, I'm going to say yeah. <laughs> um, I think, undoubtedly, social media has made it possible, and other sorts of uh, digital technologies, have made it possible for people who are in isolated parts of the world to feel connected to a community, and that can only be good. Um, as a sort of necessary side effect of being visible, and this is a central paradox of um, like queer activism, as soon as you make yourself visible, you also make yourself a target, but then that reinforces the need for unity and, and cohesion and, and collective identity. So I think it's a very interesting question. I am personally, like, I'm all for social media. I think it, it's a really exciting form of, of global communication. And it makes all sorts of um, people who belong to uh, quite small um, minority groups, people who belong to quite niche queer identities, are able to find other people now. And I think that's a good thing as well. So 
yeah, I think I guess I'm coming down more on the positive side of that. But for sure, there's problems and dangers involved. Yeah, thank you. The commodification of the queer flag is doing to the meaning of it, the rainbow flag specifically, um, with like Nando's and stuff deciding. The commodification of queerness in general is, a, is an issue. Um, the mainstreaming of queer identity is a, is a thing that, that would refer to um, yeah, aspects of queer culture that have been that has historically belonged to queer culture um, suddenly being adopted by the heterosexual world. Um, and you can look to, yeah, the use of the rainbow flag, uh, drag itself is experiencing something similar. Um, I have mixed feelings about that. Um, on the one hand, it's really exciting to see a more um, wide awareness of queer culture and queer history out there. On the other hand, I feel very protective of queer culture and queer history. I might want to get, get your straight hands off it. Um, uh, but as, it's like, as long as people understand, which I guess is part of why I, I spoke about this today, as, as long as people understand the community from the outside, it should be okay. The flag itself, um, Um, yeah, no, I, think, I guess I, I feel the same way about that. I think it's important that people understand the history um, uh, and then, I mean, the point about the flag is that it's meant to symbolise, uh, apart from many other things, it is meant to demarcate uh, space as being safe in some way. If it stops meaning that, then we have a problem, for sure. Time for like one more question, I would think, probably. Yeah, go for it. Cube's on the way. Catch the cube. Hey, um, I was wondering, are there any examples of like focal points of resistance to this kind of Victorian like uh, distillation of identity? Like, were there points? Were people dissenting at that point, or yeah, in, in Victorian age? Um, yeah, um, yes, and yes. So, like, um, there are various voices in Europe that are being raised. There's a um, there's a man called Karl Ulrichs in Germany who's like, often cited as being one of the first queer activists. He's sort of he stands up and he starts. Uh, he identifies as, like, if he were doing it now, he would identify as a gay man. One of the problems that he had was there wasn't a language to express what he was at that time in that place. So he invents a language, he invents words, um, describes himself as a Uranian, which is a different sort of typology that comes out of that. Um, and he tries to convince German legislators and doctors that being a Uranian is um, a part of the natural diversity of people and people shouldn't be oppressed on those lines. To limit its success, actually, he starts something. Um, uh, so there's people doing that and also during Victorian Britons, during that time in Britain, there are the like sexologists appear, people who study human sexuality appear because they move sexuality into medical discourse and scientific conversation and people start to do science on it. And those people often say things like, maybe we should be nicer to women, or maybe it's okay if people are gay sometimes. They don't often get listened to, but they start to say it. Um, and then those ideas get picked up a bit later on. But it's, I mean, given that these ideas, this stuff, like, exists now, like, this was a really carefully pieced together system of oppression and power very solid. I think there's time for a few more questions or is it about time to wrap up? Time to wrap up. There's a question. One last question. Got the cube. I got the portal reference, by the way. Thanks. Um, 
Jamie, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I, you've, you've talked a lot about historical activism. Do you have a call to action that you want to relate to, to today's audience? for me for this question now thank you um i i think yeah i mean i think if people feel like they want to get involved i think they should get involved i think people should look around um look around them to find groups they can join to find ways to um hoist the rainbow flag higher and higher with as many more stripes as we can fit onto that piece of canvas um yeah i don't have a specific call to action i don't have a website i could point you towards but um i would yeah, I'd like to leave the idea of a call to action in everybody's heads to, to finish the talk with. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, be gay, do crimes. <laughs> Thank you.